this video I'll be going through the 2016 examination solutions for the Mathematics of Computer Graphics and Virtual Environments unit. Okay, question one, we have a ship carrying contraband that's sailing in a straight course at velocity v has been declared at position p. We have another customs post at q and essentially we need to derive an expression which gives the time of the closest approach of this customs vessel to Q. So the easiest way to do this is to draw a diagram. Okay, so here's where our, we know our customs vessel is and it's traveling along the vector V. Q is our observation point and the custom vessel will travel along this line and when it gets to this point here, it's going to be closest to Q. Now this point is determined where the vector Q minus R, which is this vector, is perpendicular to the vector V. So if you identify that and we can use the fact that the dot product between two perpendicular vectors is equal to zero um, and of course I use the vector equation of the straight line so our point R is equal to the point P plus V times some time T. Okay so if I substitute this in to the dot product, rearrange, uh, uh, make T the subject and we have this expression and that completes the question. Second question, write down the expression for the vector along which a customs vessel must sail to reach the intersection point. Well, this is very simply uh, the reverse of this vector, so it'll be point R minus point Q. Well, question 1B, uh, we have a position of three points that lie in a plane, and the first part of this question is write out an equation for the plane as a linear combination of vectors. Well, since P two and P3 are different, what this means is that the vectors P1 to P2 and P1 to P3 are linearly independent. So therefore we can calculate the position of any point on a plane, and I call it R, as the position vector P1 plus a linear combination of P2 minus P1 and P3 minus P1. A and B are just simply scalars. Part two, find the unit normal vector n to the plane. Okay, so the unit vector to a plane is perpendicular, so therefore we can use the cross product between any two vectors on the plane. So I've used P2 minus P1 and P3 minus P1. So I calculate the, the cross product, and we end up with minus three, minus five, minus one. But the question did ask for the unit normal vector. So to normalize n, we have to divide by its magnitude, and the magnitude is simply the sum of each element squared and then square rooted. So in this case, it's root 35. So if we divide by, <coughs> excuse me, if we divide our normal vector by root 35, this is what we get. You could, if you wanted to, express this as a decimal uh, value. That would be perfectly, perfectly valid. Also, uh, another normal vector pointed in the opposite direction is also a valid answer. So instead of minus three, minus five, and minus one, we could have three, five, and one. That's also a valid answer. Okay, and the final part of this question, write out the vector equation for the plane using this normal vector. So this is something to remember, but the vector equation of a plane is n, which is a normal vector, dot r, which is any point on the plane, is going to be equal to a scalar s. So in place of r, what we can do is use one of our positions which we know is on the plane. So for example, I'm going to use p1, which is 1, 2, 4. So if I find the dot product between n and p1, and that comes out as minus 17. So simply, the equation of a plane is n dot r equals minus 17. Second question, question number two. Here we have a mortar, uh, which has been fired. Uh, rounds leave the mortar with a muzzle speed of 200 meters per second. The mortar is sighted so that the barrel is 45 degrees to the vertical and the round must burst 8 meters above the surface. So the easiest way to attack this question is to draw a diagram. So here we have a vector V, which it represents a mortar. This is the direction in which the round will be fired. This is uh, 45 degrees from the uh, horizontal. Uh, I've used pi over 4 for radians and the muzzle velocity, which is going to be the magnitude of V, is 200. The acceleration, it's roughly an Earth-like planet, so we have zero acceleration in the x-direction, but we have 10 in the y-direction. And this is the point 
where we want it to, the round to explode, which is going to be 8 metres above the surface. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is calculate the velocity vector, V, and this is simply if we use trigonometric identities, so the cosine identity is cosine is adjacent, which would be the x component of velocity v. If I just draw a um, right angle triangle here, so x component would be the adjacent divided by hypotenuse, rearrange that, we get 200 times cosine of the angle. Opposite, which would be the y component of v, is similar, it'll be opposite divided by adjacent. Sorry, opposite divided by hypotenuse, which gives us a sine. So again, that's multiplied by 200. Cosine and sine of pi over 4 are both 1 over root 2, and we can simplify that here. So the question actually asks, what was the flight time of the round? And we could use the SUPAT equation. So S equals the velocity times time plus a half times acceleration times time squared. OK, so we want the um, Y component of uh, the displacement to be equal to 8 because it's 8 metres above the surface. V, Y is root 2 times 100 and that's multiplied by T and we have a gravity of 10 which acts um, in the negative direction so therefore half times 10 is 5 but it's acting in the negative direction. Rearrange this gives us a quadratic to solve, solve the quadratic and we get two values for T. Now the first value, 0.05, is going to be far too close to our mortar, so we wouldn't want it exploding there. But the second value will give us um, this point S here. The distance from the firing position which the round will burst, well this is the distance in the X direction. Um, because we've got zero acceleration in the Y direction, we don't have to worry about this second term here. So it's just going to be S equals V times T in the X direction, so that's Vx times the time which we calculated previously, giving us 3,992 metres. Okay, calculate the maximum height of the round above the firing position. Um, and this is where the potential energy is equal to the kinetic energy. So the, the uh, formula for potential energy is m, which is a mass, times gravity, times height. And kinetic energy is a half times mass times velocity squared. In this case, we don't need to know the mass because if we divide throughout by m, it doesn't matter. If I rearrange this equation, I get v squared over 2g. Um, Vy was 100 root 2, so that's 100 root 2 squared over 2 times 10, because that was what our gravity was, which simply gives us 1,000 metres. So that's the maximum height. Alternatively, you could use calculus. So here, if we scroll back up, um, I can take this expression and just differentiate it with respect to t, um, and that can be 100 root 2 minus 10t. Rearrange that, and that gives me the time at which the um, the, the trajectory of the projectile is at its highest point. Um, substitute that time value into the initial equation, and that also gives me the same answer. Question three: Standard view and pipeline for um, Generating a virtual environment, so draw a diagram. So this is a sort of the basic diagram, any less than this and you, you would lose marks. So we start at the object space, and this is where objects are defined in their own space, and they're usually defined centred at the origin. And the reason why they're defined centred at the origin is we can apply scale, rotation, and translation operations to copy, paste, uh, copy, move them, scale them, rotate them, etc. to build our world. Now the world space is aligned then to the viewing position, so the viewing position is at the origin and the direction of view where you're looking is viewed along the z-axis and this is done by translation and rotation operations. And then from the aligned world space we get to the image space, now this involves projection, so projection onto a um, 2D projection plane, we apply clipping so we, we can clip anything to the boundaries of our screen space and also rasterizing, which is converting it to pixel. Uh, part B, so the question says about the persp perspective transformation. So this is, go this is the transformation to go from uh, aligned world space to the image space. Okay, and it's the 
aligned world space is projected onto a projection plane, a viewing plane, which is a distance f from the viewing point. So given that a point R has these homogeneous coordinates in the aligned world space, what are the screen space coordinates, x dash, y dash, out of the projection? Okay. The easiest way to do this is to draw a diagram. So here I have a diagram, and this is the viewing position at the origin here, and here's the z-axis is on the horizontal, and the vertical axis either denotes x or y. Now the projection plane is placed a distance f away, uh, away from the origin along the z-axis, and what we do is we draw a projector line from the origin through our projection plane to R, and where that line intersects with the projection plane, that's our projected point. Now, the reason I drew this diagram is it's easy to see, but the triangles O, A, and R dash, or R prime, and O, B, and R are similar. So in other words, the ratio between X dash, which is this distance, or this could also be Y dash, so X dash divided by A, is the same as R, or that, that's the coordinate for X, divided by this length to B. Okay. Now the length from O to A is F, so X dash, which is this distance, divided by F, is the same ratio as X divided by Z, okay, so the Z coordinate for that point R. Rearrange that for X dash, and we get X dash equals F over Z times X. We're doing very, very similar to Y, we get similar. Next part of the question, write out the perspective projection matrix which will transform the points in the aligned world space into points in the projection plane. Now here, because we're using homogeneous coordinates of this form, so we have a four tuple, this fourth element here, we, what we do is we divide throughout by the fourth element to give us our Cartesian coordinates. So therefore, after we apply a single matrix multiplication, we need to have this uh, these should be our homogeneous coordinates. So, for example, if you notice, if s dash is equal to f over z times x, well, when we divide x by z over f, this is what we get here, and similar for y. Okay, so the, the projection matrix to do that is essentially the uh, identity matrix with the exception that here we have 1 over f, which is multiplied by z to give us z over f and then a zero there. Okay, so the next part of the question, uh, point moves along a straight line. So again, we got this straight line equation, and P is initial point and V is some direction vector. So what happens when this, the trajectory of this point is projected onto a viewing plane? Okay, so essentially it's very simple. Apply our answer from the previous part to each component along the line. So we've got component for x, for y, and for z. And if we do th that multiplication, we get these homogeneous coordinates. And of course, we have to divide by the fourth element. So this gives us our coordinates for our point on the line. Okay, so notice these are still in terms of p and v. Okay, the fourth part of the question, hence show you that as t tends to infinity, the coordinates of the projected point R dash tend to a value which is independent of P. So if you look at these um, values here, or these expressions sorry, here, as T gets very, very large, these velocity terms will dominate the P term. So essentially, as T gets very, very large, the, the P terms tend to sort of disappear in comparison to the velocity terms, and we end up, and also the T's, because we're dividing top and bottom by T, they cancel out. So what happens is this tends to uh, f times vx over vz for the x-coordinate and f times vy over vz for the y-coordinate. So you can see neither of these expressions involve the position p, or the initial point, so they only depend upon the direction of movement v. Moving on to question four, uh, but a cuboid object in a virtual world and you're given its dimensions. And it's also said to be defined in its own object space with the origin at the centre of the cuboid. Okay, so for part A, calculate the homogeneous coordinates of each of the vertices. Well, we're going to have eight in total for each corner of the cuboid. And since, for example, x, the cuboid is 20 metres in length, so we 
uh, what we have is the x coordinate will be plus or minus 10, the y coordinate will be plus or minus 5, and the z coordinate will be plus or minus 8. But here, x, y, and z will just be the origin 0. Okay, so you, what you can do is you can form a, um, a matrix of vertices, so each of these columns denotes a separate one of the eight vertices, and as you can see, you've got different combinations of um, x, y, and z with minus 10, plus or minus 10, plus or minus 5, plus or minus 8. Uh, note, there's no, uh, nothing specific about the order here, so if you were to write down something similar, but in a different order, that would be, um, that would be fine. So the next part, part B of this question, is all about moving the cuboid into the world space. So move the cuboid into the world space, it is necessary to rotate it by 45 degrees about a line, which it passes through, through its vertex, which has all positive um, components in parallel to the y-axis. So what we need to do is rotate about this vertex. So this is the only one, okay, which is this one here. This is the only one which has all positive values for x, y, and z. So 10, minus 5, and 8. And what we do is we translate the vertices by this vector, okay, minus 10, minus 5, minus 8. And what that does is that moves that vertex so it's now to the origin. Next, we rotate all vertices by the angle so pi over 4 about the y axis. And finally, we, then we translate the vertices by the vector minus t. So we essentially re reverse this translation so that the vertex of all positive components is returned to its initial position. Okay, uh, set next part of the question for each operation gives the appropriate transformation matrix. So, first, translate by this vector. Now, the translate translation matrix is the identity matrix with the fourth column ha having the um, components from the translation vector. Okay, in our case it's minus 10, minus 5, minus 8. To rotate about the, uh, the y-axis, okay, this is the rotation matrix, so um, you can see it's the identity matrix. The second row and second column is unchanged because that's um, the y uh, component. We don't want to change the y, we want to change the x and z. Okay, and the matrix is cosine of the angle, minus sine of the angle, and on the third row, sine of the angle, and then cosine of the angle. In our case, the angle is pi over 4, which we can write as 1 over root 2. If you were to write this as a decimal, then it's correct, that'll be fine. I think it's 0.707. Okay, and finally, we reverse this translation here. So instead of minus 10, minus and minus 8, we have the positive values. Notice the, the question didn't say anything about multiplying these together. Um, oh, sorry, that's the next part of the question. Show how the transformation should be combined. Well, the, the thing to remember here is when we we're going to multiply them all together, but the reading the multiplication from right to left, that's the order in which they're combined. So in this case, we have the um, overall combined transformation is T2 times the rotation times T1. So reading from right to left, we apply this translation first, then we rotate, and then we apply the second translation. So that's a key thing to remember for that. Moving on to question five, we've got a few uh, definitions of terminology it's to do with rasterization. So the question asks you to define the uh, raster image term. This is essentially an image that is uh, represented by an array of squares called pixels. Now this explanation is fairly um, short and succinct. You might want to expand on that um, if you wish. The driving axis, this is the axis in which we increment by one each time. So we take either the x or the y axis, and we add one to the um, pixel coordinates of our, our um, pixels, and then we calculate where the coordinate the other coordinate is based upon that one. The idealized image, uh, that's simply the image that we're trying to represent on a raster. So um, you might have a photograph and you need to represent that in, in using pixels. Um, part B of this script by part B, what is the main advantage of using Bretton's algorithm over, for example, the DBA algorithm? Well, quite simply, Bretton's algorithm uses only integers, which is a lot quicker um, than the DDA algorithm which requires real numbers, okay, so it's a lot quicker to do. Okay, so in this question, what we have here is this is Brescian, the error for Brescian's line drawing algorithm, and this is the error from 
uh, coordinate x, y to a straight line. Okay, so delta x and delta y are the cha changes in coordinates between the two endpoints of the line, and c is just some uh, constant and that will disappear in a minute so we don't have to worry about that. Okay so the question asks you to derive an expression for the change in error called delta epsilon between pixels whose centers are at coordinates x i y i and the one using the x axis as the driving axis um, one pixel to the right of the x uh, of this pixel and y i plus one. So the subscript i plus one means we don't know what this coordinate is. Okay, so we have to leave that in for now. So quite simply, it's the error at this pixel minus the error at this pixel. So we substitute the x and y values into this expression here, subtract them, cancel out, and it's quite simple. You get this expression. Okay, so use impression of the algorithm. Um, we use the error to choose between whether we go to the pixel to the east or the pixel to the northeast. So if the error is less than zero, we go to the pixel to the east. In other words, the y coordinate is unchanged. If the error is positive, we go to the pixel to the northeast, so we add one to the y coordinate. Okay, so there's going to be two, two different cases here. So when we just go to the east, what I'm doing here is I replace the yi plus one with just yi. And these second two terms cancel out, and the change in error is simply 2 delta y. <coughs> Alternatively, if we have a positive error, that means we go to the northeast, and this yi plus 1 term here is replaced by yi plus 1, as you see. And it's cancel out, and we get 2 delta y minus 2 delta x. Okay, the five part, question 5 part E. So it's giving you the initial error. So this is the error at the very first pixel. And it's asking you to use a Brescian's algorithm to draw the line between pixels with coordinates 3, 2, and 10, 7. So if we step through the algorithm, first thing we need to do is calculate delta x, delta y, and the changes in errors. So delta x is quite simply the difference in the x coordinates, as is delta y, the difference in the y coordinates. Um, the change in errors are going to be constant, so we might as well calculate them at the beginning. So the change in error for going to the east pixel is just 2 delta y, so that's 2 times 5. And the change in error as we go to the um, northeast pixel is 2 delta y minus 2 delta x, which gives us minus 4. Um, the initial error is 2 delta y minus delta x, in this case, gives us 3. So though, given that information, we're going to step through the algorithm, so we're starting off at our first pixel at 3, 2. Our initial error is 3, which is positive, so that tells us we go to the northeast pixel. And then because we go to the northeast pixel, I add delta epsilon northeast to 3, giving us our error of minus 1. So we go to the northeast pixel, so we're now at 4, 3. Our error is minus 1, which is negative, so this tells us we go to the east pixel. So we change the error by delta uh, epsilon e. Which is add 10 to it to give us 9. Okay, so we go to the east pixel, so we're stepping along in the x, it's the driving axis, and uh, we go to the east, so y is now unchanged. The error is now 9, which is positive, so therefore we go to the northeast pixel and we add minus 4 to 9 to give us 5. And we keep stepping through, you don't need me to explain all of that after a few. So this is, as long as you work metho um, methodically, you know, steps through, and you notice you will you should get your final coordinates being at the final point. If you don't do that, you must have made a mistake somewhere through the algorithm. Question six is about clipping. Um, so six a it says a perpendicular distance dq of the point of a point q from a plane defined by the normal vector n passing through point p is this expression. So the question asks you to draw a diagram showing this and derive this expression. So here's a diagram. As always with diagrams, always try and make them as simple as possible. So I have my plane represented by the horizontal line with a normal vector going up for n. I have my point, uh, my point P is on the plane and I have my point Q somewhere off the plane. Now, because, if, because I know where, where P and Q are, I can define this vector 
which is Q minus P. And what I'm looking for is this perpendicular distance. So what is this distance from Q perpendicular to the plane? And I can find that by drawing a right angle triangle where the hypotenuse is equal to the magnitude of the vector Q minus P. The angle is simply the angle between vector N and the vector Q minus P. And this distance here is what I'm trying to find out. Now this is adjacent to our angle and we know the hypotenuse, so that suggests we use a cosine. Also, if we, we don't know what this angle is here, but this is linked to the dot product. So the dot product between two vectors, you can count the ang angle between them using that. So the dot product between Q minus P and N is defined as the magnitude of Q minus P times the magnitude of N times the cosine of the angle between them. Now the cosine of this angle is adjacent side, which is D, divided by the hypotenuse, which is magnitude Q minus P. Okay, and these two terms cancel out here, and I'm just left with magnitude of N times D. Divide throughout by the magnitude of N, and N divided by magnitude is the unit vector N, which you can see we have here. Part B, write down a set of tests to determine if Q is in front on or behind the window edge. Well, quite simply, if DQ is positive, it's in front, it's equal to zero, it's on the edge, i.e. it's on the plane, or if DQ is negative, it's behind. Okay, so part C, uh, we've got the vector equation of the line joining two points, is given here, and we're also given an expression to calculate the T from this equation. And this uses a distance from points A and B to the plane. Uh, we have this situation, so we've got a clip region defined by four edges, and these edges are defined by their endpoints, each endpoint here. I've called them edge one, edge two, edge three, edge four. And I have this triangular polygon, which is going to be clipped to this clip region. Um, and it said use the sutherland hodgman algorithm to do so. Okay, so the sutherland hodgman algorithm, you take each edge of the clip region in turn and see if you need to clip. So if we check the first edge down here, you can see that all points are in front of it, so we don't have to do anything. So let's proceed to edge 2, and that's exactly the same. All points are in front of edge 2. So we're assuming uh, all of these normal vectors for the edges are pointing into the interior of the clip region. Okay, edge 3, well here V1 and V2 are in front, so they're fine, we could um, add them to our vertex list. V3 is behind, so the edge, the polygon edge V2 to V3 has to be clipped to a point where it crosses the edge, and that's going to be our first intersection point. And also V3 to V1 is also going to be clipped to this edge. Now, this edge is represented by a, a plane which extends to around about where my mouse pointer is here. And I call those two new points I1 and I2, so this is what our vertex list now looks like. Okay, so we've got one more this vertex than we started with. Okay, if we check edge E4, now this edge E4 extends up here, but we're now using a different vertex list. Okay, we use, uh, we're using this vertex list. Okay, so edge E4 is up here. V1, V2, and I1 are fine, they're all in front, so they can be included. But the edge I1 to I2 will cross our edge 4. And it will, cross, it will cross around about this point, which I've labelled I3. And also I2 to V1 will cross the edge 4 here. And that's our new intersection point, I4. So I2 is no longer included in the vertex list. It's been replaced with I3 and I4. And we've now considered all edges, and that's our final vertex list. Now what you need to do is calculate the um, intersection points. So here we have I1. Now to do this, we need the distance for, uh, of V2 from edge 3 and V3 from edge 3. Okay, so the first thing we do is calculate the normal vector. Now the normal vector is in the X component of the normal vector is a difference in the Y um, coordinates of, the, of each endpoint on that, defining that edge. So we've got 5 minus 4 is the X component and the Y component is the difference in the X component to the endpoint, so we've got 1 minus 6. So we have 1 and minus 5. Calculate the distance from V2 to V3. 
Okay, that's just a dot product calculation. Uh, use this expression from, if I scroll down up a bit, this expression to give us T, V2, V2, and V3 into this expression. That gives us our intersection point. And I've done that here. You can leave it as um, fractions if you want, or decimals. It, um, you won't lose any marks of converting to decimals. And very, very similar for I1, I2, I3, and I4. The only thing with I4 is here. I could have used I2 to V1, but um, I2 has um, some fractions in. And I just found it easier just to use V3. So even though V3 is not included on our vertex list, you can use V3 to V1 to clip to edge 4. Okay, uh, question seven, uh, all about hidden surface removal. So first, define a few um, methods for hidden surface removal. So painter's algorithm, this is quite simply, it renders all polygons in a scene in descending order by the distance they are away from the viewpoint. So furthest polygons are rendered first, closest polygons are rendered last. Uh, Backface culling, uh, essentially this, what it does is any polygons which are facing away from the viewer, so that means their normal vectors uh, pointing away from the viewer are ignored, are culled. And we could determine this by if we calculate the dot product between the viewing vector, which extends from the origin to the center of the um, polygon, dot product with n, if that's negative, we have a, um, sorry, we have a front-facing polygon, not back-facing, a slight typo there. Okay, uh, Z buffer. This is uh, similar to painted algorithm, but on a pixel by pixel basis. So you have an array called the Z buffer, which has same number of pixels in it, uh, sorry, same number of elements in it as pixels in your display. And each element represents a distance um, for that pixel to the closest surface. And you also have another array, which is the same size, called the frame buffer. And that's used to contain the color of each of the pixels in the display. So what you do, is the distance from the viewer to each pixel is calculated. If that distance is less than that currently stored in the Z buffer, it replaces it, and the, frame, the equivalent element in the frame buffer is replaced with the color of that polygon. Part B, um, explain binary space partitioning process and the formation of the binary space partitioning tree. Well, essentially, BSP is a process of dividing up your space into subspaces and you've got to keep going until all your subspace contain convex sets. Now the reason we do that is we can render convex sets easily because they don't um, intersect with each other or the polygons in a convex set um, don't overlap. Okay, um, so here we've got a very simple example, we've got three polygons and I've chosen to insert a hyperplane, which is a plane that cuts the space along A so A becomes my root node. The front subspace, so the front subspace denoted by the which way the normal vector for A is pointing. So this subspace on the right is the front one. And any polygons in the front subspace get listed in the left child node. And any polygons, for example, C in the back subspace get listed in the right, uh, right child node. You can have a case where you've got coincident polygons, which in this case are plain can pass through two polygons and where both your polygons have normal vectors pointing in the same direction. In this case, we can group them like we've done here. Okay, part C uh, gives you a plan view of a virtual world. So here we have our virtual world. The polygons are labeled A uh, through to V. Okay, and we are always, we're assuming these polygons have normal vectors pointing into the interior. So A would have a normal vector pointing up would have a normal vector pointing to the left. Showing all the steps you take and labeling clearly any new polygons that are generated, create a BSP tree. <coughs> I should point out that there are many possibilities, uh, many possible correct BSP trees for this, but I'll talk through um, the steps I took. Okay, so my first step is I chose HNR, uh, to which, on which to put my hyperplane. So I have HNR as my root node, and all, all of the polygons which are in front of HNR, which is this right portion here, I've listed in the left child node, and likewise all those behind in the right. 
by inserting a hyperplane along HNR, I've cut A into two. So here's HNR, so A is cut into two, so I've labelled the, the polygon part on the left A1, and I've labelled the polygon part on the right A2. So there we have A2. So if I just take the front uh, child node to start with, so I have this region here, I need to cut this up. So I've next chosen E and O to put my hyperplane along. So F and G are in front of E and O, but also F and G are convex because they, they're facing each other. Okay, so EO becomes a root node and F and G is um, convex on the left child node. Behind EO, I've got um, A2, B, C, D, P and Q. This isn't convex. For example, C is facing down and D is facing to the left. So I'm going to have to split that up. So to split that up, I've chosen to insert a hyperplane along C and Q. Okay, so this is my third hyperplane. So in front of C and Q, I've got B and A2, which are facing each other, so they're convex. And likewise, behind I've got D and P also facing each other, so they're also convex. Okay, so this is the this child node uh, done with finished because they're all convex sets. Now we need to move on to the back child node here. Okay, so this corresponds to all the space um, behind um, my first cut. Okay. Uh, the next cut I'm going to do is so I'm going to put a, a hyperplane along M. So when I put a hyperplane along M, I split them up into I, J, K. So I have I, J, K, L behind, sorry, in front and behind I've got A, a 1, V, U, T, and S. Okay. So I need to split this one up because that's not convex. So I have to scroll back up again. Okay, I've chosen J, which to split it up. So what that does is those polygons K and L in front of J, they're now convex, and so is I behind. Okay. And if I also split this um, area up, I just scroll up again. Okay, and I've chosen to go down T, so T will split A1 into two, so I've labelled one part A1 and the other part A3. Okay, so I split it into two, so in front of T I've got A1, V and U, which are convex, and behind T I've got A3 and S, which are also convex. Okay, so now I can put them all together, and this is the complete BSP tree. This is the one which is used to mark this question. So, as you can see here, I've clearly um, outlined each step um, which I take because the question asks you, if I just go down up to the question, showing all of the steps that you take. So, you should clearly state what steps you take. Okay, part D, using that BSP tree from part C. Now, I mentioned earlier. But there are many possibilities, so yours might be different from this. But you can still you, you, you should still get um, still do part D. So using your BSP tree from part C, determine your ender and order of polygons, given that we're looking at them from these. So from this point P1, this point P2, and this point P3. Okay. Now to do this, we use an in order tree walk, and essentially, uh, if we start at the root node HNR. And let's consider P1 to start with. Okay, so the root node HNR. We look to see whether that's front or back facing. Now HNR, we, if we're at P1, we're looking at the back of HNR. Okay, so because we're looking at the back, we go to the front child node. Okay, if we were looking at the front of it, we'd go to the back. But we, we're, we're looking at the back, so we go to EO. And from P1, if we look at EO, again, we're looking at the back, so we go to FG. Now, once you get to a leaf node, you add that to your rendering list, followed by its parent node, and then go to the other child node. So here you can see FG, my first um, polygons to be rendered, followed by EO. And then I go to CQ. So where's CQ? It's this. And in this case, we're looking at the front of it. So if I was at P1, we're looking at the front of CQ. So I go to DP, and it's a leaf node, so I render that DP followed by its parent, CQ, followed by A2B. 
Now, the rule is once you've rendered a lead node, you render its parent, but we've already added, added CQ to our list, so then therefore we go to the grandparent, but I've already added DO to the list, so we go to the great grandparent, which is HNR, and proceed down the other end, the other tree. Okay, look at M. M is back facing to P1, so we go to the front subtree. Look at J. J is front facing to P1, so we go to the back, so our next polygon to add is I, followed by its parent J, followed by KL. Trying to add J, but we've already added it, so we add the grandparent node M, and then we go to T. Now, T is front facing P1, so I go to the back subtree, which is S and A3. Add the parent node T, and finally the last node A1, U and V. Okay, if you do the similar for the uh, other two points, um, you'll get a different list. The thing is to notice about these lists is generally speaking they go from furthest, so for example P1 started off with FG, furthest polygons away, and ends with A1, U and V, which are the closest polygons. Last question eight starts off with a definition of terms question to find a texture map. Well, this is a, a, a bitmap or raster image. So remember that's made up of pixels that is applied to a polygon in the screen space. Uh, Textile is simply a pixel in your texture map. The screen space, um, we already looked at that earlier in the exam, but the screen space is a space that results from projection of the world space onto the projection plane. And a scan line, this is simply a horizontal row of pixels. Part B, we've got this texture map of a smiley face. Um, with the aid of diagrams, explain how the colour of a pixel on the scan line, so remember I mentioned that was just a um, uh, horizontal row of pixels. Um, how is the colour of those pixels along the scan line determined from the texture? So here's the... Uh, Diagram this is taken from the lecture notes. Okay, so this is my screen space polygon, and this dotted, uh, this dashed line here is my scan line. And the scan extrema, which is denoted by PL and PR, are where the scan line, the horizontal row, intersects with the edge of the polygon. Now, in the texture space, I can calculate the equivalent points of PL down the left hand side of this uh, texture map. And the equivalent PR is on the top edge at this point on the texture map. So if I draw a dashed line between those two, okay, as I move along the horizontal scan line, I move the equivalent um, scale different distance along the dashed line, and the colour of, of the textile along that dashed line gives me the colour of the pixel on the scan line. Um, Part C, why is perspective texture mapping preferred to linear texture mapping? Well, when you use linear texture mapping, it doesn't take into account the depth of a pixel, or depth of a polygon. Um, that can result in a skewed mapping. Uh, perspective texture mapping does take into account that depth, and so that's preferred. Okay, and the final uh, part of the question on the exam, explain using diagrams the technique of bump mapping. So with bump mapping, if you wanted to model this surface, and this surface is curved, using a flat polygon, well, the flat polygon has normal vectors all pointing in the same direction. So if we were to come to use a lighting model on this flat polygon, it would just look like a flat surface when we wanted it to be a curved surface. In this case, on the right, we have the same curved surface, but what we can do is we can have our normal vectors uh, mimicking the normal vectors of the the curved surface, even though it's only a flat polygon. Okay, so what we can do is if we apply a lighting model to this flat polygon, it will resemble a curved surface. Okay, so a bump map is a texture map of normal vectors. So a texture map consisting of normal vectors is mapped onto the plane. Since each pixel can have a different normal vector, the application of the lighting model means that a single polygon can appear to have an irregular surface, and examples of these are, for, are if you've got a cobbled street, uh, you can represent that cobbled street with a single polygon, but apply a bump map so that each cobble sort of reflects light in a different direction.